Now that it's been nearly a month, the dust is starting to settle on the banking turmoil triggered by two of the largest bank failures in U.S. history. But are we just going from one crisis to the next? With the dust dying down, we're able to see cracks in the system that started spreading even before the banks collapsed. I'm getting really nervous now that an economy that I thought was going to dodge recession, just, is now at much greater risk of, of falling into one. And, you know, it could be quite severe because bank credit is a lifeblood for small businesses. Here are two words you're about to hear come up a lot. A sort of good old fashioned credit crunch pathway. By what is clearly becoming a credit crunch in the banking sector. Is it a credit crunch like in 2008 or is it a credit tightening? Credit crunch could be the phrase that pays if you're betting on a U.S. recession. With rising interest rates and now banking upheaval on top of it, is the U.S. on the verge of the next credit crunch? A, a credit crunch is the inability of households and businesses to get the credit that they need. I'm not sure I could say it better. A credit crunch refers to a significant drop in bank lending activity driven by a shortage of funds. The uh, possibility of the restriction of credit to be so significant, that it, under almost any terms you can't get a loan, that, that, that's certainly a risk and something that may, may happen. If that does, that's a credit crunch. We're not there yet, but that's certainly a possibility going forward. A prime example is what happened in the wake of the 2008 financial crash. Financial institutions were on the hook for trillions of dollars in worthless subprime mortgages. Banks that survived it didn't have the resources to be out there making a lot of loans. Even highly qualified families and businesses struggled to get credit. Access to capital is what fuels growth in the economy. So the credit crunch dragged on growth for years to come. The 0809 financial crisis is in a league of its own. What we're experiencing now doesn't feel very good. It's very uncomfortable, but it's nothing compared to what we suffered back uh, in that uh, crisis. Loan activity has already been on the decline because of the Federal Reserve's fight against inflation. In the span of one year, the Fed raised its benchmark interest rate from near zero to nearly 5%. When interest rates are higher, people are less likely to take out loans and spend money. The key is we have to have policies need got to be tight enough to bring inflation down to 2% over time. It doesn't all have to come from rate hikes. It can come from, uh, you know, from uh, tighter credit conditions. A potential credit crunch can be an unpredictable ally in the Fed's inflation fight. On the heels of two of the biggest U.S. bank failures in history, many expect banks to further limit loan activity. But even before this disorder, it was already happening. In a Fed survey, about 44% of banks reported tightening standards for business loans the first quarter of 2023. Excluding COVID, that is the highest share to say that since 2009. There's a, a lot of uncertainty here. Uh, you know, to, how significant is this credit crunch going to be? How big an impact is that going to have? I'm much less confident in my optimism about avoiding a recession than I was two weeks ago because of the banking crisis. Achieving disinflation without a recession was already a tough test to pass with the Fed's blunt tools. But at least they have control over those tools. A credit crunch could bring in a whole new set of unknowns. Credit tightening was already on the table, but smaller banks are getting hit twice as hard right now. And that's going to have an outsized impact on small business. Let me explain. In the week following Silicon Valley Bank's troubles, customers yanked deposits out of smaller banks and moved the money into bigger banks feeling more confident the government wouldn't let those banks fail. And it wasn't just a little bit. The latest Federal Reserve data shows the top 25 banks in the country gained $120 billion in deposits from March 8th to March 15th, while all the other banks below that lost nearly $185 billion, the largest weekly decline on record. You have bank management thinking, OK, how do we survive this now? Well, we probably don't do it by, by lending. Banks use deposits to fund loans. So now all of these banks that lost deposits are going to tighten credit even more. And who uses these banks? Small and medium-sized businesses. According to UBS, smaller and regional banks hold 40% of these companies' loans and debt. Bank credit is a lifeblood for small businesses, and most people work for small businesses. They drive a huge amount of economic activity, and they're really going to struggle. And in some ways, they already are. On Tuesday, Richard Branson's satellite launching company Virgin Orbit filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The company failed to find a funding lifeline and is now looking to sell its assets. When a public company like Virgin Orbit goes bankrupt, there are no shortage of headlines. But there's an undercurrent happening right now in the bankruptcy world that isn't getting as much attention. This year, research shows private companies are filing for bankruptcy at rates that exceed what we saw at the height of the pandemic. 
UBS says a lot of these bankruptcies are at smaller firms for now, so the impact on assets and employees is not as egregious as the sheer number of filings. Experts say real estate is one place they're seeing a bankruptcy boom, while healthcare, retail, construction, restaurant, and financial sectors are ones to watch. I want to bring in the Honorable Kevin Carey, a former bankruptcy judge and current president of the American Bankruptcy Institute. If this was happening prior to the banking crisis, you said that it's been ticking up for the past couple of months, and we knew that credit was already tightening prior to that as well. What does a potential looming credit crunch do on top of that for businesses? We've been talking about for really a long period of time now um, for the recession to happen. Um, and so a, a lot of the level ending is on hold. Uh, you know, investors don't want to put money into a, a volatile economy uh, when it looks like there's uncertainty. The banking, you know, I read today that um, in his message to shareholders, Jamie Dimon at JPM Chase said, um, you know, the banking crisis isn't over yet. He says, it's not like it's going to, like it was in 2008, um, but there's still reason to worry. Uh, look, and it's not just in the U.S. Look what happened with Credit Suisse and UBS uh, in Europe. Um, so that's also, I think, creating some air of uncertainty. Look, we found out with Silicon Valley is that once a run on a bank starts, it can't be stopped. You've overseen a lot of bankruptcies, and I'm wondering, with your expertise, what happens to businesses when capital is harder to come by? Well, and you put your finger on it, it's liquidity, right? Once liquidity runs out, um, companies are faced with very few choices. Uh, and of course, so many of the Chapter 11s now are filed for the purpose of uh, conducting a going concern sale of the business. Uh, you know, seemingly long gone are the old traditional chapter 11s where a company would stay in for a while, restructure, uh, fix some business problems, or, you know, rehabilitate some business units, uh, fix its balance sheet. Uh, now it's so frequently uh, simply to get a sale. Uh, and of course, sale orders signed by a bankruptcy judge have great value for, for buyers who know they're getting a business free of, um, liens and other interests, which otherwise might hold a business back. You know, we haven't really seen much of an impact of this uptick in bankruptcies and the unemployment numbers yet. But if you consider that more than half of the privately employed workforce works in those small and medium sized businesses, what do you foresee happening this year? Well, see, that's, you know, that's one of those, you know, factors that kind of swirls around, you know, unemployment continues to be down. Um, you know, there are other factors like high inflation that that are negative influences on the economy. Uh, it, it really, it just depends on, on what a particular business's issues are. You know, whether a business is in an industry that's growing or not growing, uh, and whether the, the business is over leveraged. So many of the businesses that find their way into Chapter 11 are over levered, uh, and businesses find themselves in a situation in which there's just no way out but to sell the company. You touched on this. Everybody seems to be waiting for that recession to come. You know, the Fed's been walking such a tightrope trying to bring down inflation. They predict unemployment's going to go up about another percentage point this year. They are hoping to still avoid a recession. But what is your read? So I think everybody um, hopes to avoid a recession, uh, except maybe those in the restructuring industry for whom that um, supplies work. Uh, but I, I, you know, look, I know a lawyer, uh, old bankruptcy practitioner, who likes to say I, I predicted the last three recessions seven times. So even when it <laughs> seems apparent, even when it seems apparent that we're headed in that direction, um, often we don't get there. I mean, the government's uh, look what the government did with Silicon Valley. I mean, it's it can still play a major role in. Um, affecting the economy one way or the other. And I always wonder whether if something looks like it's going to happen, what the government will do. The Honorable Kevin Carey, president of the American Bankruptcy Institute. Thank you so much for your time today. You're very welcome, Simone. Speaking of what the government will do, on May 1st, federal regulators will release their investigation into the epic collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. 
But Congress is keen on addressing something that happened just before regulators took over. Mere hours before the federal government closed down Silicon Valley Bank, the bank dished out employee bonuses. To be clear, the annual payout was planned before the bank's collapse. But that is timing at its worst. Tack on CEO Greg Becker cashing out 3.6 million in bank shares less than two weeks before the failure. And you've caught the ire of Washington politicians. It's outrageous that these people took bonuses and sold stock in the days leading up to the bank's failure. We should hold these executives accountable for the fullest extent of the law and claw back those bonuses and stock sales. Federal regulators immediately fired the bank's leaders, but SVB executives and directors still have a cushion to fall back on. Smart Insider says they've cashed out 84 million worth of stock the past two very profitable years, not to mention millions paid out in executive salaries. And now there's a bipartisan push to claw some of that back. The next time a bank fails, that is. Co-sponsor Senator Elizabeth Warren says it'll give bank leadership the incentive to be more cautious, especially since that claw could reach back five years before a failure. If you load this bank up on risk and the bank explodes, you're gonna lose that fancy bonus. You're gonna lose that big salary. You're gonna lose those stock options. The FDIC says SVB's collapse put a $20 billion hole in the government's deposit insurance fund. And that'll have to be replenished with a special fee on banks. Federal regulators told Congress they do have substantial authority to hold bank execs accountable. Potential consequences include a prohibition from banking, civil money penalties, or the payment of restitution. We intend to use these authorities to the fullest extent we are able. But multiple bills proposed in the wake of the bank collapse are looking to extend that reach. If you are looking for an additional authority, specific authority under the FDI Act for clawbacks probably would have some value here. The bipartisan nature of some of these bills make it appear as though it'll be a shoe in But Congress has been here before. In 2009, the House overwhelmingly passed a bill, 328 to 93, that would tax the bonuses of high-earning employees at companies bailed out by the government. But it never went anywhere in the Senate. The CEO of the largest bank in the U.S. is warning the government to avoid knee-jerk, whack-a-mole, or politically motivated responses to the latest bank failures. In his annual letter, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon said the latest banking risks were hiding in plain sight, saying this wasn't the finest hour for many players, from the banks that failed to hedge interest rate risk to the Federal Reserve. He added the current crisis is not yet over and there will be repercussions for years to come, but that it's nothing like what happened in 2008. It's the first time Diamond has commented publicly about the crisis. Over the past month, he's been meeting behind the scenes with regulators and other bank CEOs. He also led efforts to stabilize First Republic Bank from collapse, which included pulling together a $30 billion lifeline to the bank. Diamond warned that the debate moving forward should not always be about more or less regulation, but about what mix of regulations will keep America's banking system on top. And we know he has the ear of some of Washington's most powerful. That's it for now. I'm Simone Del Rosario. Follow the latest banking crisis coverage at straightarrownews.com. Along with every San original unbiased report, we're also working to give you a full picture of what's going on in the world with our Media Miss tool. Use it to see what other outlets are missing.